So um, in uh, the in the uh, tantric tradition that I follow, we say namaskar. Uh, it means I greet the divinity within you with all my mind and all my heart. Namaskar. And uh, my name is Dadaguna Muktananda. I'm a meditation teacher of Ananda Marga. Uh, Ananda Marga is a spiritual and social service organization. Basically, we do two things. We we teach med- we practice and teach meditation and other personal development practices. And we also do different types of social service. Like um, we have a really um, globally recognized disaster relief team called Amert and Anandamag Universal Relief Team. Uh, we run schools ar- all around the world, children's homes, um, we, and different other types of um, community development projects. So there's basically two sides to what I do and what we do in a, as an organization, the personal and the social, the individual and the collective. Um, so how did I get to um, wearing an orange turban and being a yogi. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I was, when I was growing up, uh, it, it was this kind of narrative fed that, you know, that there's nothing more to life than having a comfortable life, having enough money, enjoying yourself and all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't satisfied with that. It didn't ring true. And so I dropped out of, eventually I, um, I dropped out of university and started my spiritual search, which involved reading a lot of books about um, meditation and spirituality. And eventually I found uh, the path that I was looking for, which is Ananda Marga. It actually means path of bliss. Ananda means bliss and Marga means path. Ananda Marga means path of bliss. And ever since then, I have, I've never looked back. It was, it's just what I was looking for and it's right for me. And I believe that it's right for, I mean, you know, it's not like a religion which is um, specific, culturally specific or specific to any particular belief or um, it, it's, it, it's a universally applicable spiritual and social system, which I believe is relevant to everybody. So I try to, part of my um, life is, uh, of course, I practice meditation and everything. And I also try to uh, convince others to practice it as well, because I believe it's good for everybody. Mm. It is. It definitely is. Um, is this, so specifically, Ananda Marga, is that how you pronounce it? Ananda, uh, A-N-A-N-D-A. Ananda. Ananda Marga. Ananda Marga. Um, what led you down that path? Was it, was there, um, like, what got you introduced into specifically Ananda Marga part of yoga? Well, I, I, I believe it was, um, it was my destiny because I hadn't uh, investigated, well, perhaps in a, on, in a very superficial level, but I really hadn't investigated any other path or any other group before I found an Marga. And as soon as I found it, I was, I was, I felt like I was, I had returned home. Mm. <clears throat> so that's just how it happened. And uh, so I think it was destiny that I was meant to find it. Was it founded by your guru? Yes, by my guru, Sri Sri Anandamurti. He, uh, he founded the organization back in 1955. And, uh, you know, as well as teaching the, the practices, he also, he did a whole lot of other things as well. He, he used to work like 20 hours a day. He'd only sleep uh, two or three hours a night. Wow. And he'd, um, as well as running the, the whole, founding the organization, teaching all the practices, running the organization, he also um, giving thousands of dis, uh, you know dis, spiritual discourses and darshans meetings and things like that. Uh, he also uh, introduced a um, a social philosophy called neo-humanism, mm-hmm. a socio-economic theory called Prout, progressive utilization theory, which is aimed at um, righting the inequities, the socio-economic inequities in society, and uh, 
and a, a new science called microvita, which he believed was 200 years ahead of its time. We're yet to, I mean, nobody really understands it, including us that, that you know. Uh, what is it called? Microvita, microvita. It's a, it's a new science, which is, um, the concept is that uh, um, consciousness is within everything and, mm -hmm. and within matter as well. And, and the new science will be in recognizing that and working with that concept rather than, than the concept of um, materialism. Mm. Because materialism has run, run into a brick wall, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. so, so the way forward in terms of science and in life in general is to recognize consciousness as the essence of the universe and matter and our own minds as well. Mm. So, so that's, the, that's, that's the thing. That, that's the way to do it. And as well as that, he also wrote over 5,000 songs, spiritual songs. That's nuts. That is insane. Yeah, in eight years. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, if you don't sleep, if you only, you only sleep for four hours, you have the time to do that. It's insane. I guess you would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, in one, one of your videos that I watched, you said that the, the guru is... Um, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You said the guru is a perfect reflection or a reflection of perfect consciousness. Um, yeah. Can you describe or try to describe what perfect consciousness is embodied in a human being? Right. Well, first of all, I haven't experienced perfect consciousness in myself. So I need to make that disclaimer first. And secondly, uh, you can't uh, perfect consciousness or pure consciousness or infinite consciousness, whatever you want to call it is beyond the mind and beyond thought and beyond words. So you can't describe it anyway. Mm. But if I was to try, I mean, just, you know, the, the way I kind of approximate it when I try to talk about it is, um, is, um, the, the essence of us all, the, our, our most, your most, essential feeling of existence your most precious feeling of self within you your your beloved feeling of uh, your your we say the beloved within you the the higher consciousness the the greater consciousness the great the great spirit within everyone and everything like the witness the witness is also another way of saying it the witness is another way of saying it because say for example you say i am okay there's an i there i am but there's a second i behind there's a that i know that i am that mm. first i is witnessing your i yeah that first i is witnessing the amness when, that's right uh, yeah. yes so the first i is the is the supreme i the overall i of the universe mm. so the the concept is that your i feeling or feeling of of existence or awareness is part of the greater i feeling or existence or um, consciousness of the universe your consciousness is one with the infinite consciousness of the universe just like a wave is one with the sea a, there are many different waves on the surface of the sea uh, they're all individual waves, and you'll you'll note also that they all have a very transitory existence, but they're all one with the sea. The sea, they're one with the sea, and the sea is the essence of them all. So ju just like that, uh, our consciousness is one with the infinite consciousness of the universe, and that infinite consciousness pervades and is the essence of all minds and all things and all beings in the universe the entire universe everything 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 is one yes yes and do you see that as you know i can say that to you and you can say that to me and we we agree and, and we, we nod and say yes everything is one but not you wouldn't be able to say that to everybody else at this time and we you know and actually come to that conclusion um do you see that is that part of that um, science that you talked about that I actually forgot the name of 
uh, earlier. Microvita. Microvita, yeah. Yes. Is that the, the belief? Is that we are collectively going to come to that conclusion eventually that everything is one and live on that level and wavelength of consciousness? I believe we will. Uh, we're, we're evolving as, as, a, as humanity on this planet. We're evolving very fast. Uh, we're undergoing a huge shift in consciousness. It's happening very quickly. Yes. And I believe that we'll very soon we'll get to the stage where we, we, we recognize we're aware of consciousness more and more within our lives and within the whole concept of the existence of the universe. And we'll, we'll work with that, um, on that paradigm. Uh, I believe we've, we've gone through this materialist paradigm for the last two or three hundred years or whatever it's been since the, um, since the Renaissance, I think, that it kind of, you know, crept in after they um, rejected religion. You know, religion was has basically gone downhill since then. Mm -hmm. And materialism has come up as the kind of like the accepted paradigm in the world. But um, now we're realizing that that's not a suitable paradigm. Uh, and, and I believe that this spiritual paradigm of recognizing consciousness as the essence of everything in ourselves and working according to that paradigm with science and, te and technology and all sorts of things, like, for example, with computers also, we can, we can go even further. There's been huge technological advances, but we can go even further by using cells and the consciousness in cells as in memory banks and things like that. So there's many different ways in which we can use this concept of consciousness, the consciousness paradigm rather than the materialist paradigm to improve our lives and to, and to evolve even further as, as humanity on this planet. Because of course we've come a long way. Say for example, as human beings, we've been on this planet for around a million years. You know, the, the first cavemen, for example, evolved about a million years ago. And so, uh, and, and, and the evolution for m the vast majority of that time, that million years, was very, very, very slow. Mm -hmm. And then about 10,000 years ago, there was the agricultural revolution. And so it kind of sped up. And then... Uh, and then there was the about um, 500 years ago, there was the industrial revolution and it sped up even more. It's like an exponential curve, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then 50 years ago, there was the information revolution. And we've been going through that. And I believe now it's, we're, we're going, we're, we're accelerating even more into the, um, the, the upward swing of the exponential curve with, with the spiritual revolution. Mm. Yes. Yeah. The spiritual revolution. I definitely, and yes, it, it's like every day that goes by, it seems to be the, the curve is getting steeper and steeper. It seems just, yep. and it really just comes down to more people uh, as every day that goes by realizing, you know, there's more to life than just materialism. Like you said, there's more to the human experience than just uh, getting stuff and gaining things and, you know, the ego there is more to this experience and that's, that's what always what, interests me i'm sorry what are you saying i'm agreeing with you absolutely oh. yeah it, it always interests me that um how people come to these conclusions this this newfound state of being like i that, that's why i called it the conscious perspective i that's what i call that the conscious perspective of kind of where we're heading to like the, that same wavelength that um that paradigm that we're talking about i see it as just like a a, a, a matter of perspective and it, it it always everybody has a different story it either it seems to be from a uh, struggle like some people just have just like very traumatic events some people go through psychedelic experiences some people uh meditate yoga kundalini yoga whatever it is but there's there's that that wavelength that you touch upon and it, it seems like you just don't go back I think it's like once you open the door and you see on the other side even if you close it you know what's on the other side and it's just like something that we it's like a switch in our heads and yoga is a way to it seems activate and 
stay on that wavelength, right? Yeah. Well, you know, if you're if you're a, f- a frog in a well, for example, you you think that you would think that the well is the only reality. But say, for example, that frog jumped out of the well and it saw around it that there's a greater reality. Then, of course, it's not going to believe it. Well, I don't know. The, it might forget being a frog. But you're not going to. Once you experience a greater reality, you you you're not going to forget that it exists. Yeah. If you if you're stuck in the house, you've only grown up in a house, and then suddenly you go outside, and you see there's a much greater reality. You're not going to believe that inside the house is the only reality anymore. Mm-hmm. So, the of course this is um this is an advantage of uh, mind altering drugs, but I don't recommend that. Um, uh, that's not a sustainable path. No. <laughs> but mind altering drugs can open the mind to a greater reality. Mm-hmm. And and once and once you're open to that, then there's no going back, because um, you know we as human beings we don't want to go backwards. We only want to go forwards, and we're we're evolving. We're we're in the we're continually in the process of expanding our minds and expanding our existence. So this is a natural process of expansion of mind. And uh, and the way to do it sustainably is through yoga and meditation or the yogic lifestyle. So yoga, it, it basically has the same meaning as tantra. Tantra has been misconstrued as being only the sexual element. But basically, yoga and tantra have the same meaning. Tantra means to expand one's existence, and yoga means to unify one's individual existence with the infinite existence, which Mm. means expansion. Mm -hmm. So they they both have the same meaning. They're both the same thing. And they're a whole lifestyle. They're a philosophy and a lifestyle. The philosophy is there to kind of give you a perspective and to convince yourself and to convince others that of the um, path. Uh, but the main thing is the practice. The most important thing is, the, is to actually practice it, to, to implement the principles and practices of yoga or tantra in one's individual life. And uh, also to try and help people socially as well. So I can talk about, I can give a brief run, um, rundown of those practices if you want me to. Oh uh, yeah, please. Uh, um, so base, the lifestyle of yoga involves, first of all, taking care of your physical health. Because without physical health, you can't do anything. <clears throat> mm. and, it, and it also means like we were talking b- before about, uh, as you so rightly said, there's more to life than, than uh, just um, having a uh, you know, nice house and material things. But it means that we have to have those things in order to live. We, we shouldn't neglect the material. We shouldn't neglect the physical. And so in our personal lives, uh, you know, we need to have sh- food, shelter, and medical treatment and all those things. So we shouldn't neglect those things. And we need to look after ourselves physically um, through different health practices. Um, you know, just the, the most basic things, the way you breathe, uh, the way you eat, the way you go to the toilet. So all these things, avoiding constipation. Constipation is, a, is, is the, the, the number one thing that causes so many different chronic diseases. So keeping your system fluid and, and eating the right things so, so that you don't get blocked up. And, you, and this also it goes into the next um, one of the other aspects of the lifestyle, which is food. You know, the kind of food that you eat is very important, not only for physical health, but also for your mental health and the way your mind feel, the way you feel mentally. So we say in yoga, the, we should eat a sentient diet, which is nothing, you know, you don't eat anything with a face. It's vegetarian, but it also means not eating Things like well, the two or three things in particular: onion, garlic, and onions, garlic, and mushrooms. Particularly onions and garlic, they have a very negative effect on the mind. It, they, they, the effect they have on the mind is the opposite of clarity. Oh. Kind of a dulling, a clouding. 
So if you want clarity of mind, if you want focus and that kind of like that real feeling of clarity in your mind, avoid those two things. Mm. So that's food. That's uh, a tough one. Onions yeah. and garlic is... Well, is it's a tough one for a lot of people, yeah. But I believe this is the next thing. Okay, we've, we've had, the, you know, in the last 10 or so years, veganism has come up really big. And that's good because, you know, it's not good to eat animals. Uh, but the, I, I believe the next wave will be, okay, to say, to take that a step further and to say, okay, veganism is good for the body and for the planet and for animals. But let's take that a step further and say, well, what's good for the mind? Okay, veganism is also good for the mind if you take out onions and garlic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you take out those two things and mushrooms as well, but not the effect of mushrooms is not as bad as onion and garlic. But if you take out those things, then you're expanding the concept from good for good for the planet, good for animals, good for your physical body. You're expanding that out a step further to good for the mind. Yes. But better. You know, yes. it's a, it, it, it's, it, that's, that's what evolution is. You, yes. You're expanding your, your, the way, the, the good things that you have in your life, the, the way that you, um, the good things in which, way in which you can live. So, so that's, um, so that's food. And then there is, um, uh, uh, living a, an ethical lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Very, very important. In fact, in yoga, it's said that morality is the base. Ethics is the base that you, the foundation that you build your spiritual practice on. You have to have a clear conscience. If you don't have a clear conscience, then you can't do much else in terms of, you know, searching within yourself. Mm -hmm. So always try to do the right thing. You know, there are many people that have gotten successful and rich without doing the right thing and they can't sleep at night. So it's better to do the right thing and be able to sleep at night. I believe anyway. <laughs> yes, definitely. Because, um, you know, no matter how much money you have, if you can't sleep at night, it's not going to do you much good. Yeah. Mm. I think the difficulty is that people, um, what's right and what's wrong is, uh, it's, it's different in other people's minds. What, what may be right to somebody is, it seems right to them and they sleep at night and don't even know. Like morals are uh, subjective, I guess you could say, to a certain extent. Like they're subjective to a certain extent, and they they're a little bit flexible according to circumstance. For example, if you're starving, you don't have any money. If you steal an apple from a fruit shop, you know that's that you did that out of necessity. Yes. You know. Yes. So so that's it's not as bad as doing it without necessity. So so there's there, there's determining factors which which are variable. But the essential ethics, I think, is the same for everybody, and everyone knows that yeah. that you, you know you shouldn't, as much as possible, you shouldn't harm others. Uh, as much as possible, you should, you should, you, you should use your words in a way which is going to be helpful to others. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean telling the truth always, because sometimes it may harm, it may do more harm by t if you tell the truth. Yeah. In certain situations, you can do more harm by telling the truth. But it means that you always try to use your words and your actions in a way which is helpful to others as well as yourself. And big thing with the yogic um, yogic morality is that if there's a conflict between your personal welfare and the social welfare, you should always go with the social welfare. So that can be painful. Mm. That, that could be a hard decision to make, but it's the right one. So, so that, you know, that's why, why I say always try to do the, the right thing under any circumstance. It's not always going to be the right thing for you, as well as the rest of the society, but if it's the right thing for others, then try to do that. Yes, yeah. it, it just comes down to selflessness and just seeing the other person right. as yourself. Selflessness rather than selfishness, right. Exactly, yes. And, um, and, and that feeds into the next one, which is 
service to others, always try to help others as much as possible. Uh, because we, we all know, we, we, we were fed this line for many years that, uh, you know, try and get, get as many things as you can for yourself and you'll be happy kind of thing. But, you know, the old saying, it's the giving that's going to give you the happiness rather than the taking. It's not the taking, it's the giving, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. We all know that. So the more we can give to others, of course, they should be in need. We, should, we shouldn't, you know, there's no point in carrying coal to Newcastle. There's no point in giving money, money to a rich person. Yes. But helping people in need as much as you can and doing it with a real feeling of self, uh, that you, selflessness, of course, it develops self, selflessness rather than selfishness. But doing it with a feeling of you're doing it completely selflessly. You're, you're not expecting anything in return. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not like a business transaction. You're not doing it to get anything in return. You're only doing it as a, as a service to others. But of course, when you, if you can really do that with that feeling, then you, you get the greatest thing in return anyway. You, don't, mm -hmm. you may not get anything material in return, but you get the greatest thing in return, which is the mental, the satisfaction that you're helping others. And that really impacts deeply on your own psyche and your own uh, progress as well. Yes, because you don't so, build karma from it, right? Right. You get, well, the idea is to, is to do things with cosmic ideation as much as you can, so you don't get either positive or negative karma built up with that. But... If you're helping others, regardless of whether you do it with cosmic ideation or, or not, you're only getting good karma for yourself. You're not building up any bad karma. Mm -hmm. you're, in fact, you're exhausting your bad karma. We all have good and bad karma. Uh, and uh, the more we do things, whenever we do something selfishly, selfishly for our, for our own satisfaction, we're building up more negative karma. You know, because yep. if it's not, if, if we do something for us and it harms someone else, that's negative karma. Mm -hmm. so we don't want to do that. We want to build up, at the very least, we want to build up positive karma. And you're going to get that whenever you help anyone. But if you do it with cosmic ideation, you don't build up any karma, karma at all, positive or negative. And that's good because that means you're gradually purifying your mind. You're gradually cleaning the the mirror of your mind and the more you clean the mirror of your mind the more you can see your own reflection your own true self wow that's good the more you can see into the depths of your being wow i like that a lot that was a good one it's a good analogy right yeah yeah hmm. and, can you and describe true. cosmic ideation Cosmic ideation means, well, that's part of the meditation process, which I can talk about when, you know, there's another couple of steps to get to that. But it basically means whatever you do, whatever you perceive, whatever you sense, you try to feel that it's all part of the one, the one consciousness, the one mm. infinite consciousness. Everything is an expression of that one infinite consciousness if you can feel that say for example you're doing something you're uh, you're eating right if you can feel that while you're eating the food that you're eating is an expression of cosmic consciousness wow that's that takes your eating that'll take your dining experience to a whole new level mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's the same with anything that you do or anything that you experience in life. If you can do it with cosmic ideation, it's beneficial. So it's coming to appreciate every moment that we live in our lives because it is a reflection of the cosmic creation that we find ourselves in. It's a, like every single, is it coming to every single moment being this like, um, this beautiful uh, unfoldment of ourselves and the universe and just kind of realizing that. Yeah. That's one way of putting it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Hmm. That's um. you can imagine that if you can, if you can live like that, it's a really amazing way to live. 
yeah, is that what a guru essentially is? Is seeing somebody that is the embodiment of just constant um, presence? A guru is someone who can live like that every moment of their lives because they have realized their own selves as the cosmic self. They, there's no difference between their individual consciousness and the cosmic consciousness. Mm. So the real meaning of the word guru and the deepest, the, the true meaning of the word guru is one who, uh, it, or rather, is the cosmic consciousness working through a particular person. Mm. Now, when, if someone's mirror is completely clean, if they are a perfect and pure vessel conduit for consciousness they will only reflect reflect they will only convey that pure infinite consciousness they don't have an ind individual consciousness to speak of which is less than infinite their own consciousness uh, um, uh, is identified totally and completely with the infinite consciousness. Mm. So a guru is someone who has reached that stage of awareness and they can teach others. That's why we say in yoga that it's very, very beneficial to have a proper guru, to have the right, uh, someone who, ha who can really convey the infinite consciousness and the teachings of how to attain infinite consciousness in one's own individual self and being um to as many people as possible so that's what that's that's the real meaning of guru uh, any anybody less than that is not a guru hmm. <laughs> do and do these gurus not necessarily recognize their guru-ness is it more of just like uh oh no like, they will recognize it of course but they don't they don't boast about it they don't go and uh, you know say oh, I'm, a, I'm a guru kind of thing because you can imagine if somebody's skipping down the road and boasting oh i'm a guru i'm a guru then that kind of behavior <laughs> indicates that they're probably not really a guru aren't they? <laughs> a, guru <laughs> yeah. someone, a guru it's just like the, the cosmic consciousness exists within everybody and everything but it, it doesn't make its presence known to us mm. It works behind the scenes. A real guru will only do what is necessary to help others uh, attain or expand their sense of self. Hmm. Uh, my own guru, he, he was very, he never, never referred to himself as, as someone who was enlightened or anything like that. But he was enlightened because it was obvious because of the things that he did and the things that he knew about he he used to he used to say to people uh, things like do you remember when you were five years old and this happened and they had forgotten that and, they, and he was reminding them of what <laughs> happened to them when they were five years old <laughs> that's yeah that's almost like having magical powers yeah it's a it, it, it's a it's a magical state of being hmm. but he used to say that there's, there, there's nothing supernatural about it this is all natural it's just that what we consider natural is more limited to what the, the possibility is. Mm. You know, we all have the potential within us of being a guru, of being, of conveying that infinite consciousness to, to the fullest extent. We all have the potential to be really great and to, be, and to have psychic powers and to communicate psychically. I think that's also part of the future of humanity. We will be communicate communicating telepathically and things like that we all have those powers and and potential within us and it's only a question of time we're all heading we're all expanding our existence we're all expanding our awareness it's only a question of time uh when you know, when when we're going to achieve those that state of, of being mm. isn't it interesting to be born during this time in this incarnation it seems like to me that all you know i obviously you must believe in uh multiple lives and past lives and as do i so it seems interesting to me that i was born in this incarnation just seems very special it seems like um much different from even say 100 years ago 
and then you can go further back and further back. And it seems as though, you know, we are coming to either recover something we've lost or just coming into, or just coming into some kind of metamorphosis at this point um, as, as the human species. And it's yes, so good. It goes back to what we were saying before, that we're in that kind of that steep upswing of the evolutionary curve. Yeah. Humanity at this point in time on this particular planet, because there's different human civilizations on different planets throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. but our particular human civilization on our particular planet at this very point in time is in a very, as you say, a very um, 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 uh, auspicious and, and good point in time. It, it's a great point in time to be living because we're evolving so quickly. We're, we're, we're really accelerating the progress of our evolution towards consciousness right at this particular time. Mm. So it is a great time and place to be at the moment. Although, of course, it can be challenging as well because we have many, because whenever you have uh, 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 whenever you have movement, or rather I should say the greater one's movement, the greater one's progress, the more obstacles you also have as well. So you can see globally, we're having a lot of uh, things to deal with as well. Yes. Personally, in our individual lives, as well as globally, as a, as, as a global human society, we're having so many obstacles and different things to deal with. But... Um, it's, it's not that we're evolving despite those things. We're evolving because of those things also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're the things that are compelling us to evolve more and more and more. And that evolution is also creating those things also. Yes. It's the polarity of the human experience. Yeah. Hmm. Where do you see human beings in the next 100 years 50 to 100 years do we have these psychic abilities are we hooked up to computers um what do we look like what do you see for the future of humanity well i'm not going to pretend to be able to predict um uh what what will be like in 100 years but i believe that we will will be in a much more evolved state uh i believe that we will have a society which is based on more equitable and, and just and equitable principles of distri uh, distribution of wealth and resources. Mm -hmm. I believe that we'll be quite advanced in terms of that, uh, in terms of looking after everybody in the society as a whole, rather than just the top end of the spectrum. I, I, I believe and I hope that there won't be such a huge wealth gap um, between the rich and the poor in society and between rich and poor countries as well. I, I hope and I believe that there'll be, I, I don't think we should have everybody equal in terms of wealth. That's communism and that didn't work. That, that's not, that, that doesn't go with the human psyche. Mm -hmm. But there should be a, a smaller gap between the rich and the poor, but not rich and poor, but there should be a smaller wealth gap. There shouldn't yeah. be poor. We yeah. should all be wealthy in terms of resources and, and also in terms of psychic, um, um, mental, uh, you know, creative pursuits and um, intellectual achievement and, uh, and spiritual progress as well. We should be a rich society, but that doesn't mean that we should all be super rich. It just means that we should all have the resources, the physical, psychic, and spiritual resources that we need in order to fulfill ourselves. And I believe that we will be, if not there completely, but we will be a hell, hell of a lot closer to that kind of society in a hundred years time. Mm. Yes, I believe and that. I also, yeah, and I also believe that we will be communicating in much more subtle ways and methods. Uh, I think in a way, the whole kind of online computer thing is a precursor to a much more telepathic way of communicating. Mm. Yeah. Uh, at the very least, I think we'll be a lot more sensitive at, um, at reading others' thoughts and r intentions and feelings and, and a lot more empathetic and compassionate as mm -hmm. well. Mm. So, 
you know, there's a lot of good things. We've come a long way in terms of many different aspects of our lives so far, but there's a lot more that we can do uh, to take. Um, there's a lot of good things in our society at the moment, but there's a lot of work we have to do as well to take our society to a to a lot, uh, you know, a, a better place, more equitable, more compassionate, more empathetic, and um, and and you know, a, a, a more uh, an equitable distribution of of resources in terms of uh, you know between countries and and within any particular country and a lot more time and opportunity and inspiration and uh, and the situation where people can utilize their deeper potentials rather than just going and working nine to five and things that of course the nine to five thing is breaking down fast and th that's been a big bonus of, of this year that we've broken that down even further and, <laughs> yeah. and, and so and, and and people a lot more people realize now that we don't have to be on this kind of treadmill where we're just working and eating and watching tv and sleeping we can restructure our lives and society so that we have okay we we need to work but we we can first of all we can do more meaningful work we can make our work more meaningful as much as possible and we don't have to do as much of it we can do it more efficiently we can also use you know the uh, evolving technologies such as robotics and things like that to to necessitate us doing less work mm -hmm. right yeah. uh, and with and if we have a more equitable distribution of wealth then it means that we can do less work, but still have what it, whatever we need in order to live, mm -hmm. right? Still have purchasing the, the right the proper purchase or even more purchasing capacity because there are people that don't have enough purchasing capacity, even though they're working two or three different jobs. Mm. Well, that's, yeah. a, that's a crazy thing, especially in the US, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, in the US, the... Uh, the 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 gap or rather i should say uh, correct me if i'm wrong but the middle class has been steadily dismantled over the last few years mm -hmm. the last 20 30 40 years or whatever so that there's there's not really a middle class in well i suppose there still is but a lot less than before and it's more of an ex extremes of wealth so that even even the middle class uh, having to work really hard in order to get the what they need for the cost of living yeah so that survival. shouldn't that shouldn't be the case that should not be the case that's a crime that that's a crime that wealthy country that that exists in so-called wealthy countries yeah uh, the wealth of a country is not measured on the wealth of its wealthiest citizens. The wealth of a country is measured on the wealth of its least wealthy citizens. Mm. So we should be, mm. and, and I believe we're heading towards, and I believe we'll, we'll soon attain it, we should be a society where the least wealthy have whatever they need in order to fulfill themselves physically, psychically, and spiritually have enough time and enough space and enough uh, opportunity to do whatever they want to do. And, but at the same time, they also have the incentive to do more and gain a bit more than everybody else. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in general, the wealth gap should be a lot smaller. If you take a look at the wealth gap now, it's in the order of billions of dollars it should be more like you know 10 million or 100 million or whatever yeah that should be the wealth gap between the very poorest and the very richest which is still a lot it's still a big gap it's still a lot i mean <laughs> are you what what are you going to do with more than 100 million dollars in your life i don't know <laughs> what's anyone going to do with more than 100 million if we can d redistribute put a wealth get wealth cap on everyone's wealth mm. and that wealth will be redistributed throughout society and a lot of it will go into collective wealth 
yes. right? Infrastructure, com uh, collective spaces, uh, um, common spaces, you know, the, the, the collective wealth of the society will, will increase and that will increase the, the beauty and the, and the, and the, and the uh, it'll make, you know, cities and, and countries and the world much nicer places. If you, yes. you know, you, you're walking down the street and you see beautiful, like, you know, um, uh, beautiful buildings that are meant for the, the public, public use and there's um, renewable energy all over the place and there's, uh, uh, it, it, there's so many um, possibilities to make our lives better in terms of individual and collective wealth. Mm -hmm. And, and, and with, with a more conducive physical environment, we can use the opportunity, that opportunity, and with more space as well in, ter in terms of time, more time on our hands, we can use that opportunity, not only for intellectual and creative and sport pursuits and things like that, but we can also use it more and more and more for spiritual, for our spiritual pursuit as well. Yes. So this is, I believe, where we're heading. We're heading to a more, uh, a much more progressive and evolved society on all different different levels. Yes, it just essentially seems more just civilized and collective, and less yeah. about me, 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 and more about us, all of us, one. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Ideally, well, yes. That's the essence of a, of our future society, of a good society, is that it's is that it's um it it it's it's based on the concept of social welfare rather than just personal welfare. Mm. Of course, there should be both. Both should be there. But the concept is one of individual, or the concept is that individual good lies in collective good and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. the more collective good we have the more that will impact on us individually as well and the mm -hmm. more individual good will make a more collectively good society as well yeah there's um ramdas has a quote he says the best thing i can do for myself i mean i'm sorry the best thing that i can do for you is work on myself and um it's kind of like a basis i see that as like it's work on myself not not um egotistically and not for material gains right. work work on myself so i can better facilitate a better world for others it's you know i we all have to do our own work but right. if you if you dedicate your own work toward bettering others work or just lives in general then that is that's the essence right i i would um i would expand that out into okay the best thing i can do for you is work on myself Mm -hmm. And the best thing I can do for myself is work for you as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So if we do both those things, that's the concept of helping. Those are the two pillars of, of yoga, the yogic lifestyle, self-realization and service to all. Mm -hmm. Working on yourself and helping others as well. Yeah. Those are the two pillars of the yogic lifestyle. Yes. Serving yourself and serving others. But it's the same thing, right? right? So it's right. the same that's the that's the next step is in our evolution is we see that is it's that coming to that conclusion of all of us can you imagine a world where we're all on the same page where where everybody knows everybody knows that like you we are all one it's a completely different world and paradigm that i really can't fathom right now even though i can see it in the distant future but it just seems so distant, but yet it doesn't seem it that far away at all. Like it seems like we have a long way to go, but it really all it takes is just a simple switch for everybody. <laughs> just a simple, oh, it's a, a simple awakening, a simple um, just spiritual revolution that we come to. And um, I, I think we'll get there. Well, that's what we're going through right now. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting that you say it seems like a long way away, but at the same time, it doesn't seem so so long so far 
after all yeah, it's, it's because just... we're getting there we're getting there very fast yeah <laughs> that's what it is it, it is it is a lot greater than what we've already got, but at the same time, we're moving there really fast. Yeah. So we are going to get there. Of course, it will, society will never be perfect. You can only attain perfection within yourself. There can never be co complete perfection on the physical level in terms of materialist, uh, material objects and things like that. But we're, we are heading very, very, very fast towards a much more aware and uh, and empathetic society hmm. it's happening as we speak well it's amazing isn't it yes <laughs> and and the and the great thing is that it's our destiny to get there yeah the, this is one of the great things about yoga that the philosophy and the perspective of yoga is completely positive you know, in different religions in the past, people were told, oh, if you don't do the right thing, you're going to end up in the wrong place forever, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a completely negative, um, disparaging or, or um, disencouraging kind of viewpoint, isn't it? It's very, um, people, you can imagine how people would feel really, um, really bad about that. Yeah, and fearful. Um, fearful. If, if, because to, to err is to be human is to err. We all, none of us do, you know, we've all made mistakes. And if we, if we're told that, you know, if you've made mistakes, you're going to end up in the wrong place forever. That's a terrible thing. Right. But the, thing about, the thing about yoga is that, and the yoga philosophy and yoga practice is that we are working towards a one positive destiny, one ultimately overarching positive destiny, which is oneness with the, which is, which is the total and uh, unlimited experience of infinite consciousness. And, and that is inevitable for each and every one of us. It's inevitable that we each, at some point in time, it's only a question of time that we each will attain that state of realization and that state of awareness and that state of existence. Mm. And it's also inevitable that our society as a whole will, will continue to evolve and to move towards a, uh, the kind of society which enables and facilitates um, our, the, the, per, the inner search, the personal search of each and every one of us. Mm. It's very optimistic. That's why it's I, very optimistic. I like it. It's, very, it's, it's it, it's one. It's a philosophy and a practice of extreme optimism, which yeah. which I like. <laughs> Who yeah. wouldn't like that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> realist, <laughs> pragmatic people, I guess. But because I, I mean, I guess... in a way, our society has been has been infiltrated with a kind of a skepticism and a pessimism that is. It shouldn't. I mean, I don't think people like, for example. The other day, I like I loved watching these odd couple videos about different animals being friends and stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like the other day, I saw this video of a of a dog and a horse and they're best friends. And the dog jumps up onto the horse's back and the horse rides around and then they 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 have you know they're they're really good friends. Mm -hmm. But then I saw okay, I saw the likes and the dislikes, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, it got a hell you know a lot of likes. But then there were people that actually disliked that. <laughs> Who would not like to see a dog <laughs> jumping up on a horse's back and they're, they're best friends? Yeah. The point is that with our society has become, people have become so, you know, it's, a, it's like a, it's, a, it's an illness. It's a, it's a psychological, it's a psychic disease, you know, the skepticism yeah. or negativity. Or negativity. Yeah. 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 It's a disease. So, and and I don't think anybody really wants to be negative or be skeptical or be, or feel bad about themselves or society, mm. but we have to we have to give them a society and a and a way of life and a way of living that can gradually make them feel more positive about themselves and about others. Mm. Yes, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. So this infinite consciousness that we are all eventually coming to you do mean over 
multiple lifetimes, right? Not necessarily meaning that nobody will attain it in this lifetime, but you do mean that eventually you mean our souls will eventually come to this, uh, this metamorphosis, right? Right. Mm. It's probably, for most of us, it's probably not going to be in this lifetime. But the, the point is that our, our lives are a, are a part of a continuum. So this life that we're living right now is part of a continuum that we've been uh, living in the past and we're going to live in the future as well until we get to eventually get to that point of realization. You can do it in this life. For example, Buddha, the story goes that Buddha was a, was a prince that enjoyed a lot of, you know, material and, uh, and uh, material pleasure and, and uh, worldly pleasure. Yes. And then he got to the point where he thought, what, what's the point of all this? So he left all that and he, he, he went on a search, which is basically what we're all doing in a way. <laughs> and, and he, at, but he was at the point in his uh, journey where he, he said to himself, okay, I'm actually going to take the determination to, I'm going to sit down under a tree. He sat under a tree for 40 days or whatever it was. And he took the determination not to move until he realized, until he gained enlightenment. Now, of course, we can't all do that, but it is possible if you have that determination, if you can get to a point, a place where you have that determination and that you can do that, it is possible to, uh, um, to attain enlightenment in, in this life. But even if you can't do that, at the very least, you can make a lot of progress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and the more progress you make, the more good you're going to feel about yourself anyway. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't gain, uh, like, for example, I've been practicing meditation for the last 30 years. I haven't gained enlightenment yet, but I feel a lot better about myself now than I did when I started. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win so situation. Still, it's still a positive, even yeah. if you haven't got there yet. Yes. The journey and is the destination. it's not positive for you, but also for everyone else as well, because you're reflecting and emanating the positivity that you feel in, inside yourself to everyone else as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, 100%. And I'm glad you said it was, it was Buddha's journey, because it almost seems like the yogic path is um, a journey or just life altogether. Once you come to certain conclusions and certain revelations about life, it, it, it seems as though that we take upon uh this journey of the human experience and not only just in this body but over incarnations and it seems like we it gives life this um goal or like a mission or i guess almost like a game aspect to it and yoga is like a way to um it seems to me a, a way to play that game better it's like a uh how to facilitate and essentially just level up in a way <laughs> absolutely right uh, if you can play life like it's a game and really enjoy it, then that's a beautiful thing. Yes. And this is, you're right. This is a very, this is a yoga concept that life is like a game that you can play and, and that you don't just want to be a spectator sitting on the sideline, but you actually want to be playing the game and really uh, enjoying it and reveling in it, and at the same time, you're you're getting you're you're um, you're fulfilling yourself. You're it's your it's your process of self fulfillment in playing the game. Mm -hmm. It's also referred to as a as a, the cosmic drama. It's like a a play that is being enacted out. We're all actors in that play. The leela, the leela, the co the leela is the cosmic drama. Mm -hmm. And another thing you said there as well is very important is that there is a higher purpose. Mm. We're playing to win the game. And so all these things that we've been told are, you know, what we should be living for, like having a, a, okay, a good family and a nice house and a good job and things that you like to do. They're not the higher purpose. They're secondary purposes right? Mm -hmm. If we only go on the concept of that there, okay, there's no higher purpose other than those, we're not going to be satisfied. We're, we're still going to be discontent. Yes. 
because it doesn't matter how much wealth and resources you have and how good a family you have and how many nice things you can do in your life, you're still going to be discontent if you can't fulfill your primary purpose, your the higher purpose in life, which is to to become to reach enlightenment, to, to become more and more aware and enlightened and self-realized. Mm -hmm. And 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 the feeling of that, because the feeling of that is what we're all looking for. It's infinite happiness. It's perfect peace and contentment. Mm -hmm. We can only find that in our spiritual search for enlightenment. We can't find it in the pleasures, the worldly pleasures and material objects of our lives. Those. That's why if we only have those things and no, and, and we don't work towards that higher goal, that higher purpose of winning the game, the ultimate game, we're still going to be discontent because those things are not going to give us the infinite happiness, the perfect peace and contentment that we're looking for. So we have to do everything. We don't need to change anything in our lives. This goes back to, okay, I was talking about the different steps of different aspects of yoga like the yogic lifestyle. Yeah. So there's yeah. also, you know, spiritual practice meditation. So we, we don't have to change any other thing that we do in our lives. We just have to do more. We just have to take time out every day in the morning and in the evening, say half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening. If you can do more, if you can do an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, but at least if you can do half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening, it's a total of one hour out of 24 each day. It's not a lot to ask, considering <laughs> it's the most important thing that you could do for yourself and for others. Mm -hmm. Just take that time out to meditate and do your spiritual practice, to go within yourself, to try to connect with your inner self, to try to feel your own self as the greater self. It's a daunting that, task for most. The idea not, of it. The idea of it may be daunting mm -hmm. if you don't know how to do it. But when you know how to do it, and this is the important thing. You have to learn how to do it and practice it. If you know how to do it, it's very easy. Of course, yes. it's, not easy to, it, it's not easy to get to the end goal. Mm -hmm. You have to work at it. You have to, and as we've been talking, about, it may take more than one lifetime. Mm -hmm. But just to, if you get into the habit, just to sit down, close your eyes for half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening, and just look within yourself is a very simple thing to do. Yes. And once you simple. get into the habit, it's very easy. In fact, you'll miss it if you don't do it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a refuge. It's a, you know, it's the kind of thing that we, we, we drink or we take drugs or whatever to try to get, to try to get some con contentment in our lives. But if you do it morning and evening, you don't need to do those things. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just you peace. Know? It's just essentially finding some kind of peace we're within all, ourselves. We're all looking for that peace within ourselves. You can call it peace, love, happiness, whatever you want to call it. We're all looking for it. And so if you have a way of finding it, connecting with it more and more each day, then it's a, it's, it's a, great, it's a very great thing that you can have in your life. So I would recommend to uh, you and your viewers that you know, to, to learn the process of meditation and to incorporate it into your lifestyle. As I said, you don't need to change anything else in your life, apart from being more, anyway, that will happen naturally, being more empathetic and compassionate and helpful to others as much as you can. That will change naturally the more you go within yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't need to change any other aspect of your lifestyle. You don't need to go and live in a cave like <laughs> they used to do in the olden days. Mm -hmm. You can fit it into your life. You can practice it every day, morning and evening, and you can be making great progress within yourself as well as well as doing all the other things you want to do every day in your life. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. And then you may end up living in a cave, but that'll come. In time. You, you can if you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> yes, you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, even if you go and live in a cave, you're not going to be free. Your thoughts are still going to bug you. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that doesn't do anybody any good. Actually, if you want to do it, you can do it. <laughs> but it's best to it's best to incorporate your 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 spiritual practice into your daily life. Mm. One hundred percent, Dada. One hundred percent. I one hundred percent agree. So everybody, listen to Dada's words. Go and meditate after watching this. After <laughs> listening to this, find a yeah. find a quiet place in a dark room and just sit with yourself yeah. for a little bit and see what that feels like.
And if you want to know a, a, a good technique, of the technique of meditation that I recommend, if you go to anandamarga.org, A-N-A-N-D-A-M-A-R-G-A.org, then there's a learn meditation button. And you'll get a kind of like a little intro into the concept of meditation. And then if you want to, you can also go to my website, also consciousfrontier.org. And then if you want to learn your personal mantra, which will really take you deep and uh, accelerate your progress, then let me know, or you can write to the anandamaga.org contact page, or let me know uh, data at, anandama, at, uh, data at consciousfrontier.org, or you can Facebook me or whatever. And then I'll try and put you in touch with a, a teacher in your area. Oh, that's awesome. I'll link everything, um, all of your information, your website, and anywhere that anybody can reach you. Um, I'm actually interested in that mantra thing myself. Okay, good. So I, I may be yeah. in touch. <laughs> but um, I think we can probably get to wrapping this thing up. So if you uh, want to say anything else before we reach the conclusion, then feel free. Well, it's been, it's been great uh, talking with you today. And uh, I think we, we talked about some interesting stuff. The important sure. thing is to, to learn the process and to practice it because it doesn't matter how much you talk about these kinds of things. Of course, talking about it is good. Mm. Um, there are a lot worse things we could we could have talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So talking about this kind of stuff is good. Reading about it is good. Watching videos about it is good. Uh, but really, the thing that's going to count is learning it and practicing it. That's what's really going to make a difference in your life. Yep. It so all comes that, down to that work uh, yourself. You do, working on yourself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would recommend. Um, going forward to, to learn the practice, incorporate it into your lifestyle and practice it. 100% agree. Um, thank you very much, Dada, for coming on. This was a pleasure. Um, I hope everybody else that listened uh, enjoyed the conversation. And if you made videos, I would watch it. So um, I was kind of disappointed to see that I think the last videos that you've made were like a few years ago. But if you were to make them, I think I would and I can speak for a lot of other people. I think they would watch it and I know you're not interested in the viewers or subscribers or anything but I think you could um help a lot of people and kind of give insight to a lot of people so I would recommend that to you and I would if nobody else in the world does then I would and <laughs> I would be your only fan Dada. Oh, thank, thanks for your vote of confidence well look even if it's just you I'm happy to do it <laughs> well thank uh, you <laughs> thanks for your vote of confidence um yeah okay I do I've been working on uh, something for the last two or three years but that I'm starting to wrap up now. But I, I do plan to do more um, videos in the future, so I'll do that. But say, for example, if you're going to, like, you know, I have, I'm, I'm interviewed by people like yourself. Um, so if you're going to, uh, and I put those on my website, so if you're going to put this online, then I can also put this on my website as well. Yeah, that would so be I'll, awesome. I'll make it available. Awesome. Yeah, I would appreciate but that. Thanks, thanks for the advice. I'll do, I'll do more videos in the future. <laughs> I think it would, um... Yeah, I just, in terms of helping other people, I think there's a lot of uh, insight that people can get from what you say. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be in touch. I mean, not be in touch. I'll, I'll be looking forward to it. And you also continue what you're doing because you're also helping people by interviewing people like myself. So that's awesome. Thank you, Dada. I will. I will try for as long as I am breathing to do whatever I'm doing, having conversations. Yeah. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> well, thank you, Dada, Great to talk so to you. much. Namaskar. Namaskar. I wish you all the best in the future. You too. You too, my brother. Thank you. Have a good one.